That song's got power in it. <laughs> Have you, brother? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It speaks to my soul. You better believe it does. <laughs> All right. I want you to turn to the first book of Moses, the book of Genesis, chapter number three, and verse number one. Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 1. Get that in one hand, the book of 2 Corinthians 11 in the other. That way you'll be able to go quickly to where the reference is in 2 Corinthians 11. And verse number 3, verses 3 and 14. Genesis chapter number 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Then in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 3, the apostle addresses the church at Corinth and he says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Father, bless and anoint this holy word, Father. I'm nothing but a messenger. That's all I ever wanted to be. Be glorified tonight, Holy One. Lift up thy high and holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, is there any doubt in your mind that the Apostle Paul is making direct reference to Genesis 3.1? None in my mind whatsoever. He uses the same terminology, serpent, subtlety. Genesis 3.1, the serpent, more subtle. So he's using the same terminology, making reference to the same event. And he says here that your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So now are we talking about a snake that crawls around on the ground or are we talking about something far, far bigger than that? In verse 14, the Bible said, And no marvel for Satan himself, note carefully, is transformed, changes himself into an angel of light. The Hebrew word translated serpent here in Genesis chapter number 3 is nakash, nakash. Look that up in a lexicon or a dictionary. Look it up very carefully and read what you have to say. Some of them will say serpent. Some of them will say snake. Some of them will say a shining mysterious creature. A shining mysterious creature. A creature that is upright on two legs. If you'll go to the book of Ezekiel chapter number 28 with me this morning, please. This evening, please. I'm a preacher. I get mornings and evenings mixed up. If you didn't, you wouldn't be a preacher. Ezekiel chapter number 28 Ezekiel 28, verse number 13. Look at this carefully. Ezekiel 28, 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Thou who? Who are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the anointed cherub that covereth. Verse 14. I have made thee so, God said. So we're talking about a cherub that was in the garden. Verse number 13. And note carefully what it says about this cherub. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, the onks, the jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle, gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. This is a beautiful creature, no question about it. So if God says that this creature was in the garden, I have to say that this must be the nakash of Genesis 3 and verse number 1. And I also must say that there must be something far, far greater going on here than simply this serpent approaching Eve or this nakash approaching Eve, and it certainly was. We know there are five cherubim. He said in Ezekiel 28, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. We have one cherub that, rep that represents the reptilian, the reptilian aquatic branch of the creation. The face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of a man, the face of an eagle. That's what we find in the book of Ezekiel chapter number 1 and chapter number 10. These are the faces of the cherubim. 
What is a cherubim? It is one of the most mysterious creatures in all the Bible. And we know that the fifth cherub, this is Satan, this is the anointed cherub, showed up in the garden to beguile Eve. Notice carefully, he comes as a serpent. This serpent has something to do with the fact that he's connected with wisdom. Notice carefully, God doth know. The serpent is the one that has been worshipped practically in every culture on this earth. If you go into Mesoamerica, that simply means the Aztec, the Inca, the Mayan, you go into their culture back three, four, five, a hundred, five hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, you'll find a winged, plumed serpent. You'll find them worshiping the serpent. It's an amazing thing that how you can go from there and go to Egypt and you'll find them worshiping the serpent. You'll find the serpent showing up all over the world. The Greek word for serpent is Ophis, O-P-H-I-S, Ophis. I was in uh, Pergamum. I was privileged to be there one time. It was one of the most remarkable places that I've ever seen, Pergamum. If you remember reading the book of Revelation, it said it's where Satan's seat is located in Pergamum. They tell us that Pergamum had a library that rivaled that of Alexandria, Egypt. Therefore, we had two great libraries in the, in the, in the ancient world. One was in Alexandria, Egypt, and the other was in Pergamum, the source of ancient wisdom, the source of ancient occult wisdom. There at Pergamum, I saw something that I'd seen here in this country all my life. I saw a serpent as it wound its way up a staff. How many of you have ever seen the serpent on the, especially if you've been in the military? In the military, the, the, the doctors wear this insignia. It's called an escabulous or caduceus. It's referring to a serpent that is wrapping itself around something and is the healing arts. And there, of course, is the source of wisdom. So how in the world do we connect a serpent with wisdom? When I was at, Capern when I was at Pergamum, I went down below the amphitheater, the, the old ancient ruins of the city, and I walked down below them. And in my mind, I can remember exactly what happened that day. We went down there, and here was this long corridor. It's like walking through a tunnel. Our guide said, now here's what we believe happened when they lived in Pergamum. That the individual would walk in one side, he'd walk all the way through that corridor, and he'd come out the other side, he or she. But in the process of walking through that corridor, people would stand on either side and whisper into the ear of that individual the magic potions and the magic, uh, the magic uh, words for healing. The Bible said in the book of Exodus chapter number 15, verse 26, I am the Lord that healeth thee. If you know the Bible... And you are of the, of, uh, you come from the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And folks, that's where we came from. Amen. Don't ever let anybody flim flam you and tell you that our faith as Christians came from anywhere else but from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. And if my friend, if you come from that, then you understand that the healer is the Lord God. Yet here they are attributing the power or the ability to heal to a serpent. Here we are in, 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 uh, in the Pergamum. Have you read in the book of Revelation where it says that Pergamon is where Satan's seat is located? Satan's seat. The high Babylonian priesthood was moved to Pergamum. And there it spread its tentacles throughout all of Europe. The high Babylonian priesthood that God condemns in the book of Revelation. Babylon, Babylon. And there in the book of Revelation he tells you what to expect and what's coming from that connection. So the serpent, the serpent is a remarkable thing when you look at how you can find it in ancient cultures. For example, how many of you have ever seen a relief or a, a, a graphic depiction of the ancient pharaohs? And how many of you have ever seen that cobra as it raises its head above their head? How many of you have ever seen that? That's included in, that, uh, in, that, in the crown. Now, a lot of times in the later, later Egyptology, you'll find, you'll find that the pharaoh has a double crown. And the reason he has a double crown, it represents upper Egypt and lower Egypt. And therefore, it is the united Egyptian kingdom. But they still have the snake that raises its head up above and there it looks forward. And therefore, that pharaoh is being blessed by the snake 
goddess. This is a goddess. This is the feminine goddess. Now think about it for a minute. The goddess, the, the goddess, the mother nature, Diana, the goddess. The, in the Bible, who is God? As our brother mentioned just a moment ago, he's going to answer this question that's been sent in. Who is the God and of our Lord Jesus Christ? Father, masculine, in every single place in the Bible that reference is made to God Almighty, it's in the masculine gender. Remember in Sunday school we told you this morning how that gender identity is being, is being completely destroyed and they don't want you to be male or female today. You're androgynous. You're both male and female. A brother told me this morning, he said he was at, he was at El Chico's here not long ago. El Chico right here locally. And he said he was in there and he said, and he, said he was standing outside the bathroom and he said the women's bathroom door opened and a man came out. Meditate on that for a moment. Where are we headed, folks? Where are we going? You see what I'm saying? A man came out of the women's bathroom. America is changing overnight, and you're not going to like what you see. In Hinduism, they call it kundalini yoga, and kundalini yoga is the serpent that starts at the spine, a chakra, a power point, a, a, a point, a, a, a point in the in this in a soulish type body, not a physical body like this, but a soulish type body. The Kundalini Yoga starts there, and it comes up to the top of the head, and it points its the serpent does it points its head out over the top of the head, and that's called the crown chakra. Don't you see a connection? Yes, sir. Do you see a connection between ancient Egypt and the Hindu? Certainly, practically identical. This serpent comes up over the top of the head. They say that there's a life force that moves within the body. Hinduism teaches it's called prana. The life force that's moving within the body, throughout all the body, the soulish body. They have elements of the truth because if you are a creature made in the image of God, you've got a soulish body. Your soul is fashioned. And your body is a representation of that soul, not your spirit. You are a spirit being, but you, came, you became a soul when God breathed into you. And so now are you listening to me tonight? This is remarkable stuff. It's fascinating. It's fascinating. Prana moves throughout the body. It's the life force, the life energy. And it comes to a head in the seven chakras of the body. And it reaches its ultimate goal when it comes across the top of the head and that serpent looks forward and it's called uh, samadhi. And that individual, once they have attained samadhi, they have attained enlightenment and they are free. Now look carefully what's going on here. Listen carefully to what I'm saying to you tonight. This idea of the serpent making you free and the serpent giving you enlightenment goes directly contrary to the word of God. See, as I told you before, every religion, I don't care what religion it is. I don't care who it is. It doesn't matter. Every religion on the face of this earth outside of the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ is of the same spirit. Every one of them. They're all connected. Every last one of them. And they're all connected with a serpent. Every last one of them. And so they tap into this kundalini yoga. And now, my friend, we have people going to the Christian churches in America that are sitting around quoting, uh, uh, chanting mantras, and they are doing yoga. And they think that they're, that they think that they're going to tap in to the prana, to the spirit power. Now, listen to this. Two day, yesterday, when I told you I did a lot of research in preparation for Sunday school this morning, and I couldn't cover everything in Sunday school, all stuff I'd read, but listen to this. This is important. Very important. The New Agers give names to this life force that's moving through the body. The Hindu calls it prana. The, the Buddhist calls it something else. The, the Egyptian called it something else. And this and that. And they say the Christians call it the Holy Spirit. Now what have they done? See what they've done? See what they've done? <laughs> they put the Holy Spirit on the same level as their perverted occult knowledge. Anything to tear down the Godhead. 
Colossians 1, in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Holy Ghost has nothing to do with any life force that's moving through the bodies, the soulish bodies of any occultist or any Hindu or any Egyptian or any of the rest of it. It makes no difference. But what did God say to Moses when he had him in the backside of the desert? And he was speaking to him and he had a rod in his hand. So what's that? And he has a rod, cast it down. He cast it down. What happened to it? He became a serpent. And so when he went before Pharaoh, Pharaoh, who has this cobra coming across the top of his head, who's sitting there under the power and the wisdom and the knowledge of the snake, of the cobra, of their God, what did he do? That rod became a serpent of representation of all of his power and his kingdom and his glory. It became a serpent. Moses picked it up. He could do it because God was showing that Pharaoh that he almighty was more powerful and greater than any God of Egypt. The Egyptians did the same thing. Keep that in mind. Don't ever forget that they were able to do the same thing. They created snakes, no doubt cobras, just like the God that they worship. They created them. But what happened? What happened? Moses' serpent devoured them showing them right on the spot, right before Pharaoh. He knew exactly what that meant. It devoured that serpent. And by doing that, God Almighty was speaking from heaven and say, sure you got a kingdom and sure you got power, but I'm the Almighty and you'll answer to me. He came into the Egypt, by the way, if you'll remember. When Moses came into Egypt, he came in there. He came in there to judge the gods of the Egyptians. Remember, I will judge the gods of the Egyptians. And all of these judgments that came in Egypt were directed toward the gods of the Egyptians. And all you got to do is just do a little study, reading in it. You'll find out that they worship the Nile River. It turned to blood. You'll find that all these things are direct reference where God is intervening directly and judging the gods of the Egyptians. Amen. And on the night the death angel moved through Egypt, one simple thing, one simple thing delivered them from the power of death. One simple thing blood from a little lamb Amen. and the blood from that little lamb on the doorpost and on the lintel was all it took and the death angel passed over their house and there you get the name Passover he passed over the house and they came out free really free Amen. and they came out with light because God led them in the day by light and fire by night and protected his people amen so when you get to the book of uh, Genesis chapter number three you'll find out that we're not talking about a snake crawling around on the ground. God cursed it to the ground. He cursed this creature to the ground. But what you do find out is that God Almighty proves and shows that his power is above and beyond all of that. Let's go to the book of Numbers, chapter number 21 with me tonight. And let's look at another serpent in the Bible. Numbers 21. Numbers 21 and verse number 6. Numbers 21 and verse number 6. In Numbers chapter number 21 and verse number 6, we read these words. Numbers 21, 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people. And much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We've sinned, for we've spoken against the Lord. And against thee, pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said, Moses, make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. Moses made a serpent, made it of brass, put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. I believe there are many of them in stubbornness or whatever, didn't look, and they died. But for those that looked, they lived. Notice carefully what it says, looked. That's simple enough, isn't it? They didn't have to understand it. They didn't have to touch it. Amen. Just look at it. That's all they had to do. Now come to the New Testament. John chapter number 3 and verse number 14. And here again, we have the New Testament writer, and in this case, our blessed Lord Jesus Christ himself, interpreting what happened back there with that fiery serpent. In Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent of the wilderness... Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
The analogy is very clear. The contrast is as clear as it can be. Believing doesn't mean that you have to take hold of anything. You don't have to pay anything. You don't have to do anything. It all goes on inside here. Amen. In other words, you see your Savior with your spiritual eye. If you want to use it that way, you see that he's the only one that can save you. And you cry out to him and he saves. Amen. Now your faith and my faith are in the same one. But your faith and my faith is not exactly the same. Your faith and my faith is not exactly the same. Salvation is the most individual thing there is. This is why it is a terrible thing to give a formula to people and say everybody's going to be saved the same way. In other words, you're going to feel something, see something, hear something, come to an altar call in a service, or something like that. No. Amen. Salvation is personal and individual. You may be saved on the job. Amen. One man who's in the ministry, has been in the ministry now out in California, Bill Pierce, been out there for decades. He was sitting, I think it's in a loft of a house, the upstairs of a house somewhere. He had the living Bible in his hands and he was reading the living Bible and he got saved. So I believe man gets saved. Yes, he can. <laughs> he can get saved and get rid of it and get him a Bible. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is it contains enough of the word of God to get you saved. It got him saved. He's been out there in the California prison system now for over 30 years. Bill Pierce, he was, an electric, he was an electrical engineer, folks. One of the smartest men ever come through here, an electrical engineer, quit his job and went to work over here at a nursing home cleaning bedpans because he wanted to know the will of God and he didn't want any encumbrances in the way and he wanted to give his life to the Lord and that's what he did. And I mean, he was serious about it and he got saved by reading. I'll never forget it. I got a terrible memory. It's horrible. But there are certain things that I'll never forget. And when he said he got saved out of the living Bible, I said, okay. <laughs> All right. He got saved. You might have got saved by reading the NSV. The, or the, what is it called? The New American Standard, NAS version. Or the NIV. Or the RV. The old 1889 RV. You might have got saved reading any of Good News for Modern Man. The dog patch version. <laughs> Amen. How do you get saved, preacher? You get saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Looking to the Son of God. And receiving him into your heart. That's real salvation. Yes, sir. Amen. And once a man gets, once a man's born again, then if he continues in his path with the Lord and desires the sincere milk of the word, he may grow thereby. He'll be led in on in to deeper things and to the truth. The more truth you accept, the more truth you get. The more truth, the more light that comes your way and you receive it, the more light will come your way. Amen. You shall know if you follow on to know the Lord. And so thank God for that tonight. Amen. Now, I was watching a documentary the other day. It's quite a remarkable thing. I forget how I got onto this thing, but it was in Mexico. I need to tell you this because it was quite, a, quite an experience. The thing lasted about 45 minutes. It took place in Mexico. Now, this is nothing, nothing against Mexicans. There's an awful lot of Mexican people down there that give you the shirt off their back. A lot of Mexican men. And I'll tell you something else, too, when it comes to immigration. Let me tell you something. If a man will risk his life and do everything he can to get up here and get a job and try to feed his family and send money home to his family, I think that's an admirable thing. I think it's up to the United States government to try to work something out to make this thing right. Amen. But right now it's a joke because they've got the borders open and people are flooding across the borders and you've got dope dealers and you've got prostitutes and you've got everything else under the sun flooding into this country. And you see what a mess we're in? We're in a terrible mess. So, you know, when a man wants to work, I got no problem with a man wanting to work. It's just that the system that we have right now is terrible because people are flooding over into the country and they're taking the jobs of Americans. Amen. You're following me tonight? Yes, sir. I watched this documentary about shamans, witches, witchcraft in Mexico. Mesoamerica, Mesoamerica is a reference to the Aztec, the Mayan, and the Inca, Inca Indians, the Toltec, and I think there's other groups. I'm certainly no expert on, on, on the, the ancient uh, Indian uh, uh, religions. But this 
which shaman had a altar set up where on one hand he had a cross. He had a depiction of the Holy Spirit. He had a, re a reference to the Bible. He had all the things that, is, that a, Christian, a Christian would recognize readily. If it stopped at that, you'd say, well, you know, this looks pretty good. But right across from it, he had an altar to the devil. To the devil with the pentagram. And all of the things that were associated with Satan... So on one hand, he has the Holy One, and on the other hand, he's got the unholy one. Now think about it for a minute. What did I say in Sunday school about the yin and the yang, the male and the female principle, the joining of the two? Because he joins the two together. He joins them together. He appeals on one hand to the Holy, holy One, to, holy, to the Holy Spirit, and on the other hand, he appeals to Satan. He makes an offering and a sacrifice to the Holy Spirit, then he makes an offering and a sacrifice to Satan. He's covering all of his bases, and though, therefore, he receives his power by joining the two together. Now, I've told you before, the Bible makes a big deal about making the difference between the holy and the profane. You don't mix them. You don't mix the holy and the profane. What was it? Two of Aaron's sons walked into the holy place and they took strange fire. Can anybody tell me where that fire should have come from? If you go into the holy place, where do you get the fire? Well, it, originally it did. But they have, they have something out there burning and it's called an altar. The brazen altar. Exactly. Exactly. And that altar, like our brother said a moment ago, was originally lit from the power of God. Let's, at, the, at the top of the mountain there at Carmel, when Elijah went up there and said, let the God that answers by fire, let him be God. Amen. And who answered by fire? Jehovah did. The fire came down and burned up the altar and licked up the water. So in the Old Testament, when the priest went into the holy place, he went into the holy place, not the high priest, the priest. The high priest is the only one that could go into the holy of holies. But the holy place, let me, let me you, some of you may not know, you had the court, you had the altar, brazen altar, you had the laver, you had this outside that was preparation before you could go into the holy place. Inside the holy place you had an altar of incense, you had a, bra you had a table of showbread, and you had a seven golden candlesticks. Then you go into the Holy of Holies, and in there you've got the mercy seat, the helasmus, the mercy seat. And on either side of the mercy seat, you've got the cherubim. Amen. And the angel, the, the, the cherubim that looked down upon the offering of the high priest. But we're talking about going into the holy place. Then when you go into the holy place, you carry fire to the altar of incense that burns. The fire you carry to that altar of incense is fire that God sent when he sent it down from above. It is the fire that came down and consumed the sacrifice when our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary. Amen. God received him Amen. in a sense like he did in the Old Testament. And so they carried the fire from the brazen altar outside, inside to the altar of incense, and they lit that fire. They lit those lights that lit up the very heart and soul of your salvation because you've got a seven golden candlestick representing the Holy Spirit. You've got a table of showbread, the bread of God that came down from heaven, representing our Lord Jesus Christ. You've got a priest standing there making intercession for those on the outside. But Nadab and Abihu... When they came into the holy place, the sons of Aaron, instead of taking the fire from where it should have been taken from, they carried strange fire in there with them. And what does the Bible say happened to them? It said the fire of God came down and consumed both of them and burned them to a crisp right there where they were standing. You know what it tells me in the Old Testament? It tells me that the job of priesthood carried a lot of glory, carried a lot of blessing, and it carried a lot of vulnerability. <laughs> you didn't play with it, did you? You didn't mess with it because you could sure be consumed. You know, the high priest had a bells, they say, on the bottom of his, of his skirt. And that as long as they could hear those bells, they knew that God hadn't smitten him dead. <laughs> but somebody was standing there, I guess, with a crook or something to reach in there and get him and pull him out if he didn't come walking out. Because if they had walked in there to get him out, 
the same thing would have happened to them that happened to Uzzah in the Old Testament. Uh, the, the king, when he, when he it wasn't Uzzah, who was that king that went, into the, that went in to offer a sacrifice and God smote him with leprosy right in front of all the people, smote him with leprosy because he violated the office of priesthood. So here we have the profane and the holy mixed together and he could not make a difference between the two. Look at this scripture right here carefully with me. In the book of 2 Kings, chapter 18, verse number 4. 2 Kings 18.4. 2 Kings chapter number 18 and verse number 4. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the what? Brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. The very thing God used to save them had become an idol because it was a thing. Now listen carefully to me tonight. This is important. There's an awful lot of people that go around, they got a cross on. They say, I'm a Christian. They wear a cross. There's nothing wrong with the cross. Nothing. Christians have embraced the cross for 2,000 years as a symbol of their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ because he was crucified on a cross. But that cross has no magical power. If you take hold of that cross and hold it up in front of a vampire... See how Hollywood goes? And the vampire is supposed to wilt because of the cross that's being held before it. Not so. Not so. You see, the point is this. The world does not understand what that cross represents. It's not the cross itself that makes you holy, that separates you. You can, ha you can hang 50 of them around your neck till you can't stand up straight. And it's not going to change you. But if you can see the one who died on that cross, that will set you free. The children of Israel in the Old Testament took the brazen serpent that had they knew that God had delivered them in the wilderness because of that brazen serpent. It's a remarkable thing. It lasted all those centuries, hundreds of years. It lasted. And the children of Israel had made an idol out of it. And God said, I am the Lord God that brought thee out of Egypt. I, you'll have no other gods before me. I'm afraid today that people have religious objects and religious things. And it's all about the thing and the object. And it's not about the one that it represents. We Christians are a strange lot. We believe in a God you can't see. He's invisible. We pray to a God that we don't need any symbols. We don't need anything. We don't need anything. Amen. You can go into some churches and you've got all kinds of graphical symbols. You've got everything under the sun. You've got, you got, you've got diamonds and you've got squares. You've got rectangles. You've got all this stuff. And all this stuff is supposed to represent something holy. And it, folks, for the most part, stuff like that is, I guess you might say, a decoration. Now, I'm not talking about stained glass and stuff like that. I'm talking about something that is supposed to depict something holy. You know, there's nothing wrong with a dove that depicts the Holy Spirit if you don't think that dove is the Holy Ghost. You follow me tonight? There's nothing wrong with wearing a cross as long as you don't think by rubbing that cross and touching that cross that it gives you special strength and special power and special something. Then you've made an idol out of it. And that is not being able to make the difference between the profane and the holy. And what happens is you fall into the realm of the serpent. And once you do that, then you get into the area of deception. East Tennessee used to, wasn't that long ago, that everybody in East Tennessee was saved. You couldn't get anybody saved because they were already saved. Everybody was saved. It didn't affect the crime rate any. They were breaking into houses and all that stuff. But everybody was saved. But you see, that's cultural salvation. Because we live in the Bible Belt, 
everybody's grandmother and grandfather and daddy and mother or aunt or uncle or somebody was a preacher or an evangelist or this or that or so forth and so on. So everybody was saved. That's not like that anymore. Things have changed a lot in the last few years. That's cultural Christianity. Cultural Christianity won't help you. You have to know him personally. Amen. Notice that this king tore down. He tore down this brazen serpent. That took some gall because he did the same thing that Aaron did, or not, not Aaron, but uh, Aaron allowed them to do it. What happened back there at Sinai when Joshua and Moses had gone to the top of that mountain? Anybody remember? They took the gold they brought out of Egypt and did it what? They made a golden cow. That cow was Apis, Apis the bull. They had made a cow exactly after the image of a pagan god that resided in Egypt. What did God do with it? What did, he tell, what did Moses do with that cow? I didn't know he was going to get into a Bible study. Now, but it's all right to ask you some questions. What happened to that thing? He did what to it? Into powder. And then what did he do with it? Made him drink it. He made them drink it. He stamped it into powder and he made them drink it. He sure did. And by doing that, he also showed the whole people, all of them, and thousands of them died, by the way, but he showed them that Aaron was light years separate from Moses when it came to spiritual things. Aaron was totally unable to differentiate between the holy and the profane, at least at that time, but Moses was. Even at the top of that mountain when they were coming down, and they came down and they heard the noise coming up from the mountain. Moses had a young man with him. And that young man said, this is the voice of war that I hear. And no, Moses said, no, it's not the voice of war. No, no, these people are worshiping down here. Who was that young man with him? Joshua. He was personally trained at the hand of Moses. Do you know why he was trained at the hand of Moses? Because he would be the successor of Moses, not Aaron. Do you know what happened to Aaron? What happened to Aaron? Little Bible quiz in here tonight. What happened? What, how did he come to his end, brother? Aaron. And what happened to him, though? Something happened to Aaron that was humiliating. Do you remember? Moses took him before the people and he stripped his robes off of him. He took away his, his accoutrements of the high priesthood. He took it away from him in front of the people. And he showed by doing that, Moses was vastly superior to Aaron. Even though Moses was not the high priest, he was vastly superior to them. You know why? God said, I'll speak to you through prophets, to him face to face. Why? Because Moses had a clear distinction between the profane and the holy. Moses was the most spiritual man in the whole lot by far, far above and beyond underway. And the second to him was Caleb and Joshua because they're the two that could believe God and go into the land. And Aaron was way down the line. And Aaron and his two sons, and his two sons paid dearly. They paid dearly. They paid dearly, Nadab and Abihu paid dearly for their, for their intrusion and for their lack of understanding. And no doubt that it's probably connected to Aaron. Do you remember there's another story in the Old Testament where you have one who is an old man. He was heavy, the Bible said, and he had two sons and they were priests. And people would come with their offerings to the Lord. And the Bible says that they would have a pitchfork, like the devil has a pitchfork. And they would come with their meat offerings and they would reach in there and they'd take this pitchfork and they'd pull that out of there before it got wet. And they said, we don't want sodden meat. We want meat, we want it dry so we can cook it and eat it. You know who these two were? Hophni and Phinehas. Do you know what happened to them? They died on the battlefield. Do you know what happened to their father, Eli? He fell off the wall and he died. Do you know who was the spiritual one? I'm showing you a pattern. Pattern runs through all the Bible. Who was the spiritual one? Samuel, the son of Hannah. He was raised in the tabernacle of God at Shiloh. He was raised a few feet away from the Holy of Holies. He grew up listening to the breath of God and feeling the heart of God as it beat. There's not another man in the Old Testament like Samuel. 
from Dan to Beersheba, they knew that Samuel was a prophet of God. He was the only one that could appoint a man out of the tribes of Israel with no monarchy, with no connection with anything. He could walk up and put his hand on a man and say, this is going to be your first king. Amen. And that was Samuel when he anointed Saul as the first king of Israel. The difference between the profane and the holy. God grant us tonight, dear friend. God grant you tonight. Be discerning. Be careful. Just because something comes to you with Christian terminology, it sounds good, looks good, you know, and it has all, it has everything that you think is so wonderful, and yet it doesn't make a difference between the profane and the holy. Watch it. Try the spirits. Be careful with them because you live in a very deceptive age. Very, very deceptive. And when we go back to this witch down there in, in, uh, in Mexico, this man is no more a Christian. He doesn't know anything about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a religionist. And he's dealing in demons. And that's where his power resides. I want you to notice one thing, and then I'll come to a close tonight. And I think this, to me, it, it's, 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 it's a wonderful thing. Chakras in the body, there's seven of them, major chakras. There are the minor chakras. Prana is the life force that moves through the body. And I'm talking about what the Hindu believes. I don't believe any of this. But this is what they teach. And that the serpent comes up over the top of the head and gives enlightenment. See? And you reach samadhi. And you've been enlightened. And the whole spiritual world opens up to you. And so you have attained as high a status as you can in this world once you've reached the crown chakra they call it. It's not like that with God. It's altogether different. Look in the Bible to the book of 1 Peter chapter number 2 and verse 2. 1 Peter 2, 2. 1 Peter 2, 2. The apostle Peter says this. He says, as newborn babes... Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Notice carefully. The word of God giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple, right? Amen. When you open the word of God, you're getting real light. Amen. So you're not getting occult enlightenment. You're getting real light. Where does it come from? It comes from the word of God. Notice carefully. As newborn babes, and that's how we all start. We all start that way. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. You want the foundational principles of the scripture. If you don't get them, you can't grow. What you'll do is get off in rabbit trails and you'll become, you'll become a disciple of some kind of perverted doctrine. Now, there's an awful lot of saved people out there that never grew, yet they can defend their position and I mean to tell you right now, you've got five-point Calvinists out there that can defend their position in Calvinism, but they're babes in Christ when it comes to the Bible. They never grew. They never grew. They never grew. And Baptist writers are just as bad. I sat in school. I sat in the classroom, and I listened to a Baptist writer. They're saved people. I don't question that for a minute. But I do not believe for a second tonight that the Baptist church is the only body of Christ on this earth. I don't believe that. I don't believe it. So you can defend your position as a Baptist brighter and still be a babe in Christ. So you need to grow. You need to grow. And you can't force growth. You need to grow. Now look what the apostle says, the Lord says in Luke chapter number 10, verse 21. Luke chapter 10, verse 21. Luke 10, 21. In that hour... Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them into what? <laughs> Babes. Even so, Father, for see, so it seemed good in thy sight. Isn't that an amazing thing? They ought to shout hallelujah. I mean, you may, you may not even know what the Pentateuch is, but you can be full of the spirit of the living Amen. God Amen, and have spiritual discernment right off the bat. Amen. 
as a child of God. Amen? Amen. And the Lord Jesus Christ here, of course, is making a statement by saying, God has his way of revealing himself and his word to those who are able to receive it. Can you receive it? He that hath an ear, let him hear. Say, so I got two ears. Do you really have one? <laughs> the ear that's not hearing with this, but the ear that hears in the spirit, the words that ring true is the word of the living God. And then notice this in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. The Apostle Paul now, speaking to more mature Christians, although it's hard to find very many at the church at Corinth. <laughs> you talk about a mess. The church at Corinth was in it, head over heels. But in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse number 5, the Apostle Paul says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the what? Knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Here's what that means. And this, uh, here's a simple application of it. All right, let's say you get to studying a bunch of stuff, all right? First thing you know, you become an expert in, in, uh, in, uh, in ancient religions. Let's say, for example, you become an expert in New Age movement, in their religion. You, you really, you, I mean, you really know, you know your stuff. And it begins to work on you how that, good night, man, I'm around all these people, they don't know anything. You get around other people that don't know, you know, they don't know anything. Pride begins to take root in your soul. You're going to find that the biggest battle you fight as you grow in grace and knowledge in the Lord is that battle with pride. You don't see very much pride in newborn babes. And the fact that they were humbled, convicted, and saved, there's very little pride, very little, if any. But as they grow, as they acquire degrees, as they acquire uh, you know, recognition, uh, and all the other things that go with the man-made stuff, Pride begins to well up and swell up in their soul. Let me tell you this. The more pride you have, the further you are separated from the knowledge of God. Pride will cut you off from the revelation of the Lord. Pride is your worst enemy. When I was in the hospital down here at uh, Tanova, one of the cardiologists walked in one day. I had great respect for him. A wonderful cardiologist. He wasn't my specific doctor, but he was with the group. He walked in, talked to me. I always enjoyed talking to him. Then he sat down, he looked me right in the eye. I'll never forget this. He looked me right in the eye and said, I'll tell you something now. He said, salt is your enemy. See you later. And he got up and walked out the door. <laughs> I got to thinking, my, that's what he said. He said, salt is your enemy. And he got up and walked out the door. Now, two days ago, I, got to, I, I was reading around, and uh, I don't know where I got this from, but The Lancet, I think, is where the source of it, which is a British medical journal, has just done a, finished a worldwide, apparently a worldwide uh, a, a, a experimentation with a lot of people, and they have come to the conclusion, now don't hold me to Lancet, but it definitely this has happened. They have come to the conclusion that too little salt can bring on a heart attack, and bring on all kinds of problems in your body that your body has to have a certain amount of salt. And then, of course, when I read that, I thought to myself, no, wait a minute, my doctor told me salt was my enemy. And have you ever tried to eat potatoes without salt on them? <laughs> Good night, man. <laughs> What's that, brother? Yeah, it's like eating a shingle, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, a little salt makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? But you know what I'm saying to you? I still love and respect my doctor, but I wonder how much truth there is in the other. If you want to get to the bottom of it, you'll get to the bottom of it. Why don't you type that into your computer and do a Google search on it when you get home or tomorrow sometime? And some of you in here are just like me. You're on a limited, very limited salt diet. And... Tap it in and see what it says. And here's what it says about it. It says this is a highly controversial, highly controversial study. Everything is controversial that goes against the standard norm. 
everything, everything, everything. Launch out, get out of the ship, go walk on the water with him. Go out there where he is. He'll bid you come. Remember what Peter said? Lord, Peter just didn't, just didn't crawl over the side of that boat. He talked to the Lord before he ever left the boat. What did he say to him? What did he say? Lord, do what? Invite me to come. Bid me come unto thee. Lord said, come. Peter could have walked out there, had a good fellowship with him, and walked back and got back in that boat, and everything would have been just fine. But instead, he took his eyes off of him, and he started looking at the waves. The key to casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ is to keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. The key to not letting pride begin to build and well up in your soul is to keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and ask the Holy Ghost to make him more beautiful to you more gracious to you and open the scripture and reveal him to you as he's found in every page of the Bible and you will grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. Hallelujah to God. You don't get it from the serpent. Now here's the last passage in the Bible. Turn to Revelation chapter number 12 and I'll close with this one. Revelation 12 and verse 7. Revelation 12, 7. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought in his angels. And prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. Watch this. That old serpent. Called who? Is there any doubt in your mind about the serpent, see? Called devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. How many of you know what the name Michael means? That's Gabriel. You've got two named angels in the Bible. Michael, Gabriel. Gabriel says, I am the one that stands before God. He's the one who announced to Mary she would have a child. Michael, according to Daniel chapter number 12, is the one who stands for Israel. His name is important. Because the meaning of that name opens up what happens in Revelation chapter number 12. What does it mean, preacher? Who is like God? Who is like unto the Lord God? Doesn't it show you right here who God is in Revelation chapter number 12? When Michael, who fights for God, who is like unto the one I stand for and fight for, who's like unto him? And Satan is cast out from heaven that old serpent and he's cast down to the earth and he knows he has but a short time. The 12th chapter of the book of Revelation is about the destruction, the bringing down of Satan and the preservation of the children of Israel. Because in this 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, a flood comes out of the mouth of the dragon when he's cast down to the earth to consume Israel. And the Bible says the earth opens up and swallows it. And God protects and defends his people Israel by virtue of an archangel. And that archangel is Michael. Amen. I would say to all nations on the earth, I would say to every nation on this earth, don't raise your hand against Israel. Because you're not fighting against an earthly army you will be taking on an archangel. Amen. And believe me, you don't want to take on an archangel Amen. because that archangel is God's direct representative who represents him to this earth and to these earthly people in Israel. Amen. You say, that's wild, crazy stuff, preacher, but I certainly believe it. And Israel has been through five wars and God's been with him in every one of them and he's delivered them in cases where it wasn't humanly possible. And he brought the war of independence. Israel should have lost it. When they started at the very beginning, they should have lost, naturally speaking. But the thing is, God planted them there, and he intervened for them, and they're here today because God intervened for them. And the church is here until he gets ready to take us. Amen. Amen. And I don't know of anything greater than that. Amen. The blessed hope. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you allowed us to meet tonight in thy holy name. 
And I pray you'd bless the study of your word and bless the folks who've gathered tonight. And I pray, Heavenly Father, for the Holy Spirit to be able to move freely in this house and glorify thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.